You remember when Florida State asked the North Carolina State Supreme Court to intervene in the ACC's lawsuit against them? Well, the ACC is firing back. You are Locked On ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Shout out to the everydayers for making Locked On ACC your first listen and your first watch today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts. We're free on YouTube. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. On this loaded episode of Locked On ACC, we're going to talk about a proposal that is expected to pass, which would basically allow unlimited coaching staffs in college football, whether that's a good idea or a not-so-good idea. Um, speaking of coaching, MikeFarrellSports.com has named Mario Cristobal among five coaches ready to break through in college football this year. Is the Miami head coach the only one from the ACC who gets represented? How many more should there be? Uh, but Kenton Gibbs, we got to start with uh, with the latest. This is in the North Carolina courtroom. I know we have multiple different lawsuits to keep track of. So you remember back on, on May 17th, Florida State uh, petitioned the Supreme Court in North Carolina. They want that state Supreme Court to overrule a decision from business court chief judge Lewis Bledsoe. The judge refused FSU's request to stay proceedings in a lawsuit the ACC filed last December in North Carolina. Florida State wants the legal fight to play out only in Florida. By the way, this is from the Carolina Journal, which put a, a great write-up uh, on this. So, um, the eight, let, let me summarize, Kenton, some of the ACC's points because they they just late last week, they issued a response because obviously they don't want the North Carolina Supreme Court to, to overrule the judge there, meaning they don't want uh, the ACC doesn't want the case only to be in Florida. For sure. For sure. All right. So some of these uh, highlights from the Carolina Journal. Um, ACC lawyers, they responded uh, saying, this is a few few quotes I cherry-picked here. In 2013 and in 2016, FSU, along with every other member of the conference, signed a grant of rights contract with the ACC, which transferred all of its media rights to the conference. FSU further agreed that it would not challenge the validity of its grant of rights, warranting that it had the authority to enter into the agreements. Uh, FSU's share alone in the TV rights to ESPN has amounted to hundreds of millions of dollars, the ACC lawyers wrote. So as we know, there's a lot of money at stake here. Uh, they say by 2023, however, FSU had decided that it wanted more money and sought an unequal share of conference revenue based on its value. Um, the ACC went into Mecklenburg County Court last December, quote, seeking a declaratory judgment that the grant of rights a North Carolina contract was valid and enforceable under North Carolina law. Chief Judge Bledsoe of the North Carolina Business Court ruled that there was nothing improper with a North Carolina association suing one of its members in North Carolina over a North Carolina agreement, the ACC lawyers wrote. Bledsoe, quote, found that FSU had failed to meet its burden of showing that litigation, this case in North Carolina, worked a quote-unquote substantial injustice on FSU. To the contrary, he held that these factors decisively weighed in favor of litigating this matter in North Carolina. Quote, expecting a member of a North Carolina unincorporated association that has received hundreds of millions of dollars from the association to litigate the validity of North Carolina contracts in a North Carolina court does not work an injustice of any kind, let alone one that is so substantial that any contrary conclusion must be manifestly unsupported by reason. Now, I know there's so much legalese there, Kenton, but l l right. let me say one thing and then I'll give you the floor. Um, just to make this clear for everybody watching and listening to this, we have not reached the point yet in either North Carolina or in Florida where they're really parsing through the facts. Discovery has not taken place yet. All that we're parsing through at this point is uh, venue and jurisdiction, which courts need to see this lawsuit. So in North Carolina, they can't tell the Florida judge, hey, you can't rule on this case there. They can only decide whether we can rule on it here and vice versa. So 
what we're still in at this moment until, you know, until there's a dismissal on either side. We already know that's not happening in Florida. We've got sure. dueling lawsuits taking place. So we're only right now, we're not actually really anywhere closer to a settlement of any kind or, or a ruling of any kind. We're still kind of deciding which courts should be hearing this case. Absolutely. And and in terms of where this goes and, and what I'm thinking about it, it just reaffirms what me and you have said all along, that this is going to be a process. Think about this, folks. These lawsuits were filed in January or February, correct? It was it January? In December, actually. December. Yeah. Okay. Even worse. Both late of December, these yeah. were filed in late December, which we can say, hey, the holidays, nobody's really working. Sure. Boom. Let's push it to January. So let's just say both of these were filed in January. We are six months in and we are still pre-discovery. We are still at the venue uh, portion of this. We are still at the, well, did they form shop? Well, did they illegally form shop? It's more important to right. did they form shop. Well, is there a great injustice done? Well, can we hear it in Florida? Can we hear it in North Carolina? Can we hear it in South Carolina? Can we hear it from the AG? That's the point that we are at right now, which again, affirms the idea that this is a long, drawn-out process, which, and I'm, I'm going to say this, at the risk of sounding bias for the ACC and against FSU, time is on the ACC side. Objectively speaking, the longer this goes on, the slower it goes, the more the ACC is like, yeah, I like that. That's what I want to see. Take your time, Judge. Yeah. Take your time. There's no rush. Make sure you're seeing it true before you make a decision, Judge, because this is a situation where this is a, a conference that's receiving funds based upon multiple teams going up against one school's legal team. Right. The ACC is going to be fine on this. The ACC is really in a position of strength, even if this is a situation where Florida State and, and Clemson do lead. Again, I have held all along. And I still hold that these two teams leaving the ACC is more akin to um, Texas and Oklahoma leaving the Big 12 than USC and UCLA leaving the Pac-12. It's it's a very different situation when you're thinking of the complete and utter dismantling of a conference as opposed to, hey, this thing is going to be reimagined, but it still will exist as we know it. You know, uh, it, it sounds it's been made clear, uh, including by that filing, that one of the big sticking points of why why FSU wants out so badly is that the ACC was unwilling to meet their demands of, of unequal revenu revenue sharing to the point where you know they, they would give Florida State a share of revenue that is proportionate to what they bring in, and and that was that's eerily reminiscent of what happened with USC with the Pac-12. Yeah. USC wanted a, a proportionally larger revenue share. Uh, the Pac-12, you know, would only would only go so far with that or maybe wouldn't meet that demand whatsoever. And, and that, you know, that obviously led to USC leaving, which, you know, dropped. I, and again, I agree with you. I don't think it's the same situation, but USC getting out, UCLA, that started the domino effect that eventually led to the demise of that conference. So, I mean, how how reasonable of a request is that? Because obviously the, the ACC, they're, they're not coming really anywhere close to meeting that, but they did at least – they're adapting their revenue model to be incentive based, which is not performance based, I should say. So it's not the same thing as saying, hey, you know, you bring in more revenue through TV. So we're going to give you a bigger cut. It's, hey, if you if you get to the playoff and if you win championships and you, you make it through rounds of the college football playoff, we'll give you more money for that. So it, it's definitely not the same thing. Do you think Florida State's demand is reasonable? I don't. I don't because no conference can truly give its top dogs top dog money. The Big right. Ten it is like the SEC and the Big Ten. It's an equal split. V Vanderbilt makes the same money as Georgia. Indiana makes the same money as Michigan. Like that's the reality. The reality that we're looking at here is Purdue is making the same as Ohio State. Like you said, Vandy's making as much as Bama. It does not matter who you are or how many you bring the split is equal. So to me, the ACC capitulated to the original request to say, you know what, we'll set it to be incentive-based so that way if you win more, you get more. That to me was the ultimate concession that they could make because anything beyond that, you're bending the knee at that point, which another yeah. school in Florida may need to take a lesson in, but you're bending the knee at that point. <laughs> 
Which is, it's, it's, oh. it's not something that looks good on you as a conference. At that point, you're no longer the ACC. You're FSU and the Little Steppers. That's who you are at that point. Because you are openly admitting, hey, you're so valuable to us. We will say, damn the torpedoes. Uh, forget everything that we know about conference revenue sharing. We will create an entirely new model because you're special and amazing little boys and girls down in Tallahassee. Because you're special and amazing boys and girls down in Clemson. Nobody else deserves that in the country. Not Georgia, not Alabama, not Texas, not Oklahoma, not Michigan, not Ohio State. Nobody else deserves it. Not USC, not Oregon, not a soul, but you two deserve a special split because you're so special, which the ACC reasonably couldn't do because every other school would have objected to that. Right, that's true. Then, then, then you probably would have split up the conference even quicker if that was the case. So for sure, it's it, it's a fork in the road, and either either way you turn, it's a tough one for the ACC. I get that. Now you you talk about bending the knee, despite despite not doing <laughs> that last year. My guy Mario Cristobal has been named a a coach to watch, according to MikeFarrellSports.com, which is a a good college football and recruiting website. He's got Coach Cristobal among five college coaches that are about to break through. Do we agree? And who else from the ACC should be on that list? You want to keep it locked right here, my friends. We're only getting started on this brand new episode of Locked on ACC. And you know we're only getting started with FanDuel. Folks, I love sports. I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And I'm, I'm always in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com slash on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Thank you so much for making this episode of Locked On ACC your first listen and your first watch today. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. It's called Locked On Sports Today, and it's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Alex Dono from Locked On Canes. <laughs> I caught you. You sweating over there, Kenton? I, I am because the seat is about to get hot because I know how Miami fans get. I know the seat's getting a little hot for me down here in North Carolina. So, you know, we'll, we'll get into it. We'll get into it now because um, so Mike Farrell Sports dot com has uh, has put out a list of five college coaches. I, I would argue there's probably more than five, but five coaches that are about to break through. Uh, number five on his list is Hugh Freeze at Auburn, who's recruiting up a storm up there. Uh, our guy Zach Blackerby will tell you. Uh, number four, Dan Lanning at Oregon. Can they get over the hump this year? Uh, number three, former ACC coach Mike Elko, who's now back at his alma mater at Texas A&M. Number two, Matt Rule at Nebraska. Now, turning that program around is not going to be an easy job. Maybe maybe yeah. Mr. Rule is the guy to do that. And number one on his list, Kenton, is the head coach that I cover, Mario Cristobal in Miami. And here's what Mike Farrell writes. He says, many will laugh at this. And yes, Cristobal has a tough time getting out of his own way as a coach uh, sometimes. But this is simple. You recruit elite-level talent, you will win games. If Miami isn't a playoff team in the next few seasons, I'll be surprised, he says. And, and obviously, we all know about the knee that wasn't taken last year. We know about Cristobal's reputation, but I can certainly back up what Mike says about recruiting at a high level, portaling at a high level, and the bar for talent level is no question being raised to a point at Miami where you have to wonder if – Maybe the margin for coaching errors is going to decrease a little bit as the talent increases tenfold. Well, yeah, I I think the margin for coaching error is going to increase because he's going to have a big wide room for I can make well, a that, lot that's of mistakes. What I, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that, I, that's what I, I had my I, I, yeah, I had it reversed. I get you. Yeah, yeah, I get you. I get you. I was just there to help you out, brother. So Thank the you. reality is, I I really and truly do believe that Mario Cristobal is set to have a a better a banner year per se for Miami. 
a, a type of year that Miami has not had in quite some time. I'm not sure if they're ready for the national championship spotlight yet. I'm not sure if the secondary and the depth is necessarily there to that point, but this is a year that could be looked back at as like, when we look back maybe on the 2026 Natty run or something like that, you say, this was the year that, that set it off. This was the year where Mario said, all right, I'm going to build a fence around the state of Miami. And I'm able to do so because of a year like this, because I showed, hey, listen, Cam Ward was with us for a year. Look what we did with him. Martinez was with us for a year. Look what we did with him. These are guys that we have shown and proven. If you come here, you will have the opportunity to play the biggest of big time games against the biggest of big time opponents and we'll be right down the street. So mom, dad, grandma, granddad, uncle, auntie, all that good stuff can come see you play. This is where you need to be at. He's primed for that type of year. The only unfortunate part about him being number one on this list is if he does not have the season that he's supposed to, he will end up on number one on the bus list as well because right. nobody will say, well, Mario just didn't have the talent. Well, guys just weren't there. The best case scenario, if they do have a bad year, knock on wood, because I'm not a Miami fan, but I never wish injury on anybody. And so with that being said, the only way that they could have a disappointing year and Mario be slightly absorbed is if there are injury problems, because you and I both know the depth on this team is not there yet. It's not quite there to where you have twos that you're like, I know that guy's going to be in the league. I have no doubt that guy's going to be playing on Sundays. He may not be a first round pick, but that backup right there, he's going to be playing on Sundays. You can't go up and down Miami's roster right now and do that. So that would be the only potential case where people look at Mario as underperforming this year and folks are not calling for his head. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a firm believer in becoming – that to become a championship team, I believe it's an incremental process. I, I don't right. think Miami is going to go from seven and six last season to, oh, man, they're, they're in the – final game of the college football but I believe because listen I, I I see the trend rising with Miami's talent level but like you said they don't have the talent level right now that the Georgias and the Ohio yeah. States of the world that I can I can increase that list if you want me to I, I don't believe they're quite there maybe they can sneak into a 12 team playoff uh, I, I believe part of the incremental process of becoming a championship team in the case of Miami it's never won an ACC championship before get back to that ACC championship game, which would only be the second time in program history they've been there in that conference, that is, try to win the ACC this year. I'm not saying that will be easy because, you know, Florida State, Clemson, and some sleepers are looming there. But I believe yeah. that that's the sort of thing where, like you said, if you want to try to make yourself a championship caliber team for 2026, this, this could be the year that they take the big step forward. And, you know, to what you said about not wanting to end up on that bus list, I, I think we would all know what it would take to get there, right? Another, you know, another late game coaching gaff, you know, in, in a season where Miami's expected to win, you know, nine or more games to win eight or less with pretty easy schedule compared to what they've had in recent years. I think anything short of some would say anything short of 10 wins. I'll, I'll, I'll be graceful to say anything short of nine wins would be a massive disappointment. So that that's what that would look like there. But I'm, I'm very curious to see what Miami puts together this year, because from Cam Ward to Damian Martinez to what they've added to their defensive front seven. It looks like it should be a really good football team this year. So Cristobal makes the number one spot on the top five. Who do you think would be the next ACC coach that you'd say should break through? Because when you're talking about breaking through, yeah. obviously Dabo Sweeney has already broken through a long yeah. time ago, yeah. right? You, yeah. Mike Norvell broke through last year, mm -hmm. you know, 13 and 0 start to the year. So I, I think just in keeping with the theme of this program, Kenton, I'd probably say Brett Pry because we we've been we've been yeah, you know, our, pra yeah. our praise of Virginia Tech has been so high. Maybe Pry breaks through this year. I absolutely agree. He's poised to do it. And like I've, I've talked about their weaknesses a lot, but I have not highlighted their strengths enough. This is a team that, while I talk about how undersized they're on the defensive line, they are physical as all hell on the offensive line. That combination of Byshaw Tootin and Kyron Jones in the backfield. It's it's box office TV. If you have not seen those two play together, you need to go back and watch the film from last year because Byshaw Tootin is said to be the special return man. I think he has higher a higher upside as a every down back than many people are giving him credit for. So with that being said, I really do think that Pride, if they can stop the run, if they can consistently stop the run, or not even consistently, if they can have spurts to where they can just get you behind, to where the run is not as viable of an option, that team could be 
dangerous. But I want to give another team that many people are saying, oh, they're not only are they breaking into the conference, their head coach may be set to break out. Former Miami guy here, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Rhett Lashley. Yeah. If Mr. Lashley and that team do what many believe they will and win that eight, nine games, whatever the case may be, they have the lowest bar for what would be a breakout season amongst ACC coaches, right? I could have easily been a homer and said, oh, Dave Doran's going to probably for a breakout year. But for Dave to have a breakout year, he needs at least 10, at least. Right. You know what I mean? You got to be playoff material if you're breaking out of your him. But Rhett Lashley, if he comes to this conference and finds an eight-win season on a schedule that doesn't look all that tough, you're looking up and you're saying to yourself, is SMU here to stay? Are they a power player in the ACC from day one? Which would be nothing short of miraculous to an extent. Now, now let me throw one at because I some people may bring this up in the comments. I would say this one is already broken through last year, and that's Jeff Brom. Well, you mm. would say he, he I, I think he already broke through in his first year. Yeah, if, if a conference championship appearance in a power four conference is not breaking through, then what is? You yeah. know what I mean? Like what, how, already. how much higher do you believe this ceiling to be? And if if you believe the ceiling to be much higher than it was last year, I would like to tell you that Tyler Shuck is your biggest fan. You are not his. I just want to make that clear to you because that's that's quite a, a jump to say that this team will be even better than they were last year. With that in mind, if if you were to see a breakout year from Brown, what would that look like? For me, you have to win at least a conference championship, yeah, which I means agree. a playoff appearance if it's going to be a breakthrough year for him. And I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they have the playmakers at the moment of truth to get it done with Penny Boone leaving and you having to break in a new quarterback who's been, you know, he's like the guy from SpongeBob. My my skin is made of of paper and my bones are made of glass. Every day I wake up and I tear – like that's that's who you got a quarterback at the moment. So it's really a, a question of what would you consider to be a breakout year for them? Because if Louisville goes back and they lose again, would you say that that's a breakout year? I wouldn't. You got the exact no. same results as last year. Yeah, same same so result, yeah. At minimum, you have to go to the ACC championship, which is why I don't think that that's necessarily an accurate assessment. Now, if there was a list of underrated head coaches – in the nation, if you were to throw Braun very high on that one, I'd absolutely agree with you because many people could not have seen what he had coming in year one. Wow. That, that is well said. Now, here's something I really want Kenton's take on as a former NC State football player. So, because I, I personally, I saw this report and I said, I can see a lot of positives here. Kenton can bring up, can bring up the cons as well. Um, this division one, council is going to vote on basically unlimited college football coaching staff sizes a, a lot could go wrong with this we'll talk about that more when we come back you want to keep it locked right here on this brand new episode of locked on acc passion drive and patience the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive ebay motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Locked on ACC. Thank you to the everydayers for making us your first listen each and every day. So uh, shout out to uh, Pete Nakos at On3 Sports for... Uh, bringing this to my attention today. So uh, as part of their annual meetings on Tuesday and Wednesday, today and tomorrow, this week in Indianapolis, the 40-person council from all 32 conferences will vote on a legislative proposal that would expand the role of support staff. Specifically, all staff members would be allowed to provide te technical and tactical instruction to athletes during practices and games. So what that really means, Kenton, is because, uh, you know, several years ago, Nick Saban really made it famous for hiring like big name coaches as analysts on his staff. And, and the role of analysts, you know, they're able to break down film, help formulate game plans. But analysts uh, to this point have been strictly forbidden for giving on-field instruction. And 
if you're caught giving on-field instruction as an analyst, your school can get punished for that. So if this proposal passes and they expect it will pass, analysts uh, will will be allowed to provide on-field instruction. Now, the initial positive that I took from this, Kenton, is and and I, you know, uh, so, someone that I, I chat with is a former GA at the Division One level, and he actually likes this idea because it, it, you know, it gives. And some analysts are like, you know, former big time coaches, like all the ones that Nick Saban used to hire. Other analysts are like up and coming, you know, former GAs and stuff like that. Right. But this just gives, you know, basically opportunities for some of these analysts to kind of sharpen their coaching chops and advance up the ladder a little bit quicker. So that's the positive side of it. But there are definitely negatives here uh, as well, Kenton. And you as a, as a former Division One football player, I'm sure you can explain some of those. You know, I was always told, that coaching gets you through the first three steps or the three steps at the moment of truth. One of those two things. Other than that, everything else is about you going out there and being a ball player. So what does that mean in terms of not allowing analysts and coaches or not allowing analysts and unlimited coaching in terms of on-field performance? At some point in time, there are too many chefs in the kitchen. You need to let God, if you recruited this guy, because he is a dude, let him be a dude. Let him do what he does. And I'm not saying that any player is so great that when they are initially bought to campus, they need no coaching. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is everybody coaching these players at all times, and there's all these different coaches, even if everybody's rowing the boat in the same direction, even if everybody's going in the same way, maybe your oar speed is a little different from somebody else's and now you're clicking up against each other. You're looking at multiple potential problems in terms of too many hats telling you, hey, you know, when we're in cover two, you need to look for the swing. Well, no, 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 no. If it's a hard to look for the swing, but if it's a soft two, you need to become an open. Well, no, 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 no. If it's a soft two, hard two, it doesn't matter. You still need to be, you know, it's, it's all those things of sometimes you just got to tell a player, hey, this is your assignment. This is the way that we want you to play it. Now go out there and figure it out. Whether it works out or not, we'll discuss it after you're done getting your reps. We'll discuss it after the game. We'll discuss it then. But we don't need an analyst to be on the field giving direction all the time because I don't know if most of our viewers have ever seen the sideline during a game. But there are some coaches that are literally – I played under Ryan Nielsen. Anybody who knows anything about Coach Nielsen, he's a legend in the game. From start of the game to finish, he's coaching. He's coaching. He's, he's, hey, this is what we need to do. We need to run a text on here. Hey, there's a natural game development. If you keep getting up field like that, there is not time for an analyst to come in and, and think that they have say so and all that good stuff. So I'm sure that it'll pass. I'm sure that teams will figure it out and figure out the balance that works for them. But, and, and I'm, I'm sure that they'll use this as a way to get some former players opportunities to get into coaching and all that good stuff. What's a definite bonus? But I just don't, uh, you know, how many coaches do you need on staff? How many guys do you need on the right. sideline at once? Yeah, and so like I, I think there's definitely an argument to be made to allow staffs to increase a little bit, but just not unlimited instruction. Right. Because one thing that I've noticed has become very common now at the Division One level is because you know everyone wants to have as many position coaches as you possibly can for like you know the the, the quote unquote most important parts of the team. So a lot of schools now don't have like a designated special teams coach anymore just because you can't have more than what is it 11 official assistant coaches on staff. So a lot of times yeah. you kind of have to delegate special teams to your existing coaches. You'll have an analyst who kind of handles the special teams, but they're not allowed to do on-field instruction. So, I mean, it, it could be as simple as, hey, we'll let you now have a designated special teams coach. We'll add another one there. You know, maybe some teams don't have like a – designated quarterbacks coach or it's an offensive coordinator that also fills that role so maybe you add a couple more assistant coaches so you know I think increasing staffs by a little bit would would be you know a pro um, also something important to note is even if you allow analysts to do on-field instruction they are not going to increase the amount of coaches who can go who can go on the road for recruiting that number is going to stay the same so that, that, that's an important distinction here uh, and then another another negative, Kenton, that's been brought up in this on three article is uh, there there would be a concern that a lot of group of five assistant coaches would leave their current jobs in order to become power four analysts now that they'd be allowed. So that would create like more 
more of a coaching carousel in the group of five that some of your coaches would leave because they'd say, hey, if I can be you know an analyst at this Big Ten school or this SEC school, I don't need to be a position coach in the group of five. I'm now allowed to actually coach there. So you'd probably lose some coaches from the G5 level. Well, I think that that's a lot like the transfer portal in terms of when it first came out, everybody thought that every player – who wasn't starting was going to be transferring right away. And we've seen that, that hasn't been the case. I think it's right. a similar situation there in terms of if you're an actual position coach, if you're the lead position coach, right, you're the lead outside receivers coach at some schools, how they do it, or just the receiver coach in general at others. Why would you leave to go be an analyst at a bigger school? Don't get me wrong. The salary may be nicer, but if you're relegated to that analyst role and that's where you're – doesn't matter how hard you work, doesn't matter what you do, you see guys skipping over you constantly, then what? as opposed to you being at, at the, your group of five school and showing, Hey, I developed this guy who's all conference, this guy who's all conference, this guy who's all conference. I'm your next receivers coach. And that's just all there is to it. Oh, okay. You know what? That's a good, great point. You know, I I think that that concern is a little overblown. Um, The one thing that I would like to see is some of these analysts move into more off field roles. And what do I mean by that? Making sure we're, One thing that we forget about college athletics, and you and I have talked about how college sports has been professionalized in so many ways, you're dealing with 18 to 23-year-olds, sometimes 17, right? I would love to see people off the field to kind of help these guys out in many ways. I would love to see a situation where, you know, we now have official like, hey, I'm your weekend transportation guy. What does that mean? You have a couple too many and you want to get home somehow. I will come there, drive your car for you. Da, 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 da. I'm an official university staff member, so I can park my car wherever on campus or near campus without fear of it getting told. I'll take your car, take you back to wherever you got to go, Uber back to the, the official vehicle and go from there. Because how many situations, terrible, deleterious situations for not only the young men on these teams, but the people around them have we seen based on bad decisions made off field that if you had a coach that was, you know, a lot in, and I'm not just saying this in terms of like analysts who are convert, converted GAs, but guys who are similar to their age group, but that can say, hey, I saw what happened with Ruggs. Hey, I saw what happened in that Georgia season. I've seen what, trust me, I got you. If you are in, if there's a bad situation popping off, call this number. We will have this analyst come get you. I, I think that would be much more meaningful to these teams than having a situation of, Oh, by the way, you have the defensive coordinator, you have the uh, the defensive run game coordinator, and now you have a nose guards coach in particular on top of your defensive line coach <laughs> to help you be the best nose guard you can be. Hey, this is what Shock and Shed looks like for the fourth time from the fourth person. I don't think that serves as much value as somebody being like an angel on these guys' shoulder and saying, hey, I'm here. Don't make that bad decision. I'm here. Well, you guys can let us know what you think in the comments below. Huge shout out and thank you to the everydayers for making Locked On ACC your first listen. He is Kenton Gibbs. Make sure you check out his other show, Locked On Wolfpack. Check out mine at Locked On Canes. And we will talk to you guys again tomorrow on another episode of Locked On ACC. We are part of the awesome Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.